Welcome to The Social Contract, a podcast created by author George S. Corey and the artist Cleo. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 9 of the award-winning podcast, The Social Contract. I'm actor, writer, producer, Tavia Gilbert. The Social Contract is a monthly podcast for political junkies who might have forgotten just how fun, and often comical, politics and Washington's political figures can be. The podcast was created by author George S. Corey and the artist Cleo as a companion piece to their books, Presidential Conversations, and the just-released Presidential Conversations for Kids. You don't need to be familiar with the books to thoroughly enjoy The Social Contract, which features fictional, often satirical send-ups of the hot-button political issues of the day. We are in a celebratory mood here at The Social Contract, and I'm absolutely thrilled to share with you a couple of very fun updates. First, the response to our last episode, our Marilyn Monroe tribute, has been amazing. Thank you all so, so much for your support, by the way. It means the world to us. That episode is now getting its own digital ebook single and audio single, set to be released on October 11th with the title Marilyn Valkyrie. It features the story we've all come to love by George, Cleo's stunning artwork, and of course, the incredible performances of Stephen DeRosa who somehow manages to voice President Biden and Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham flawlessly, and Steph Stewart as Marilyn Monroe. Be sure to look for it on Amazon and Apple Books. And as I noted earlier, I'm especially elated to announce the release of Presidential Conversations for Kids, the young reader's edition of George and Cleo's first book, Presidential Conversations, As parents start focusing on the upcoming midterms and prepare to head to the polls on November 8th, kids often end up feeling left out. I think this book provides such a fun way to engage kids in the democratic process while also learning about presidential history. In its review, Kirkus describes presidential conversations for kids as history with a wink, and I couldn't agree more. So I encourage you to check it out. It's available in hardcover and digital, and the audiobook will be dropping on Election Day, November 8th. Now, a little treat for our listeners. I'm happy to share that in this episode, we'll be hearing from the author George S. Corey and checking in with the artist Cleo as we mark the publication of Presidential Conversations for Kids, or as George calls it, PC4K. Here's his author's statement. Let's listen. After my first book, Presidential Conversations, was published, I had the idea of adapting it for young readers. That's how Presidential Conversations for Kids, what I have taken to calling PC4K, came to be. It was important to make kids the book's central characters, the stars, if you will. And in Georgie and Gigi, I found the ideal characters to lead this journey. Aladdin had a magic carpet, Georgie and Gigi have a magical skateboard. Some have asked me if 10-year-olds like Georgie and Gigi are too young to be civically minded. But from what I've learned from my 14 nieces and nephews, kids can most definitely engage in real, substantive conversations with adults, perhaps even with U.S. presidents. I became politically aware during the presidential election of 1972 when I was nine years old. One of the first political discussions I had was explaining Richard Nixon's landslide victory over George McGovern to my classmates at Our Lady Queen of Peace Catholic School in Texas. It was like we were little citizens. And then right afterward, we were back to being kids throwing crab apples at one another during recess. The nuns did not like that. That's why in PC4K, I wanted the presidential conversations at the heart of the book to be between children of today and presidents throughout history. They interact as equals, and Georgie and Gigi sometimes even help their elders make history, as when Washington crosses the Delaware and Lincoln drafts the Gettysburg Address. One of the first stories I wrote was a time travel adventure when I was 10 years old. In it, 
My four-year-old self was speeding down the cobblestones on a tricycle in Biblos, outside of Beirut, Lebanon, where my family lived, and then was suddenly transported to meet my 10-year-old self. By then, we were United States citizens living in North Texas. I stapled the handwritten story in a booklet made of white construction paper. I had pasted a black and white photo of myself on the tricycle on the cover. After all these years, my mama still has the story in one of her George boxes. And now I am back to writing time travel adventures. Only now, it's not me on my tricycle, but my much cooler young alter ego Georgie on his skateboard. Inspired by the stirring words and incredible presence of poet laureate Amanda Gorman, who spoke at the 2021 inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I created Gigi as the perfect BFF for Georgie. I hope the book shows how important character is, not just for the President of the United States, but for all of us of all ages. I hope it shows that just as kids can learn important lessons from adults, we adults can learn from kids too. We all just have to be open to it. Most of all, I hope this book serves as a reminder of how much fun reading can be and how enjoyable, even magical, learning about history can be. I just love the care and the skill that went into crafting the book's two young protagonists, Gigi, whose family comes from the West Indies, and her BFF, Georgie, who is of Egyptian and Lebanese descent. I have fallen in love with these kids, and I'm sure that you will too. And now I'd like to once again welcome the artist Cleo to the show. So much has happened with this podcast and with the books since we last spoke. And we're wondering, are you surprised or did you expect a response? Where, what's your... We've expected nothing. So it's all a surprise. I'm thrilled. I want to, you know, I want to make it more. Um, honestly, it's, it's, it's just emboldened us. Um, we're connecting with people and that's why we did it. And the podcast is just, I mean, the, the whole thing's just, we're having a great time with it. So am I. I love this project. And I am very, very excited about the Presidential Conversations for Kids, which is going to be another amazing showcase for your work. I know there's word art and heart art interspersed throughout the pages, but then there's this surprise at the end of the book. It's Cleo's Skateboard Gallery, which is amazing. And these are all very cool, colorful, bespoke skateboards that you designed. Each one features a word like equality or freedom or courage that promotes the lessons in leadership that the book offers. So I'm wondering where the idea for the skateboards came from. And I'd love it if you could also share with our listeners how you approached creating them. Well, they came mostly from George as far as skateboard. I think it was trying to figure out how to weave it all together mm -hmm. and make it interesting for kids. And we've all tried skateboarding, some more successful than others. We have decided that we are way too old to be on skateboards, <laughs> although we, we have them. When we started talking about it and talking about how to do that traveling in time and making kids interested, that's how it fell together. And then having them interact with the presidents, there's no fear. They just jump into the situation and help right. write the Gettysburg Address. And it has a life of its own when you know it's right. Truly. Well, I think they're so delightful to look at. So I'm excited for people to see more of your art. The word art, has, as a result of doing the first book, just become something that I've focused on. So when it was within the confines of the skateboard, and the colors, it just honestly kind of flows out of you. So I really had fun playing with it. And one of the last ones I did was the one that's got the mm. ivy on it, which is my favorite. They're just joyful. Totally. Well, I understand that we can expect some more Marilyn Monroe inspired art from you. In fact, you're going to do a whole series. What can you tell us about that? I took the scenes where they're described in the coda, the things that she was wearing. I basically jumped off of those hmm. and did two or three more Marilyn. Showing her different moods and strengths. I love that. She was such a strong person. Yeah, and that's not what she's immediately known for. Right, right. Well, I have to say, Cleo, that I think that the justice word art that you created for this episode, which honors our beloved Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is the perfect way to commemorate the second anniversary of her death. 
And we'll get to that in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, as someone who's both an artist and an attorney, how has Ruth Bader Ginsburg inspired you? Oh, just with hope, you know, I mean, when she started her career, the things that she fought for were unheard of as far as equality under the law. And so she kept at it and her entire volume of work goes to everybody being treated equal under the law. And I can't think of a better aspiration than that. And so it keeps us going through the day these days <laughs> is that hope. Absolutely. Well, she was such an inspiration to us and you are also an inspiration. I love, again, the joy that comes through your work and you and George are such a wonderful match because there is so much love and so much joy and good energy that is infused in his written work and so much joy and love and good energy that is infused in your art. So you are such a dream team. It's a pleasure to get to know you and to work with you on this. We find ourselves being uh, not only hopeful, but lucky. That's at least half the game, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm so glad we got to check in with our artist in residence, Cleo. You can check out her Justice Word Art in the show transcript. Now, as I teased earlier, I am very excited to kick off our two-part election series with this episode, a tribute to the late, great United States Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or the notorious RBG, as she has been nicknamed. It's called Vote Ruthlessly, and was conceived and inspired by Cleo and written by George as a tribute to Justice Ginsburg shortly after her death on September 18th, 2020. I cannot believe this month marks two years since her passing. What an incredible legacy. Now, in memory of Justice Ginsburg, it is my honor to present Vote Ruthlessly by George S. Corey, art and inspiration by Cleo, performed by Robin Miles and Stephen DeRosa. Vote Ruthlessly. I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, quoting Sarah Grimke. Letters on the Equality of the Sexes, 1837. On the evening of Friday, the 18th of September, 2020, President Donald J. Trump was on Air Force One, jetting back to Washington from a rally in Bemidji, Minnesota. Elton John's Rocket Man blasted through the speakers at a jarring volume, much to the annoyance of the staff and crew. While Trump had taken to demanding tunes like John's I'm Still Standing and the Village People's YMCA be played at MAGA rallies, for the most part, he fed the hardcore Republican heavy crowd musical red meat. Anthems like Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA and Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA. Who cares if the boss threatened to sue? Trump would show him who's the real boss. Trump took a chug from his ever-present Diet Coke and reclined back in his seat in total bliss. He could barely contain his glee at the prospect of getting to fill another Supreme Court vacancy. This would be his third. Surely the sign of a truly great president, he thought. For a moment, a very brief moment, he felt bad upon learning of the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like him, she was born and raised in New York City, albeit Brooklyn, not Queens. And he had to hand it to her. She was one tough broad. But these thoughts quickly passed as he plotted how to go about making his mark, perhaps for generations, on the highest court. And what a shot in the arm for his re-election bid! He closed his eyes and sang out, wildly off-key, along with Elton. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Just as Trump's crooning grew to a crescendo, opera was suddenly piped in through the airplane speakers. 
as if someone had abruptly changed the station. Trump pounded his call button, and Hope Hicks, the president's closest aide, scurried in, perfectly coiffed and wearing a Max Mara wrap dress. Although Hicks had been given some title like senior advisor or counselor to the president, Trump couldn't remember which exactly, he thought of her as a surrogate daughter and loyal gal Friday. Trump yelled, Who is playing opera? Who okayed that? Hicks smiled and reminded the president. But it's Tchaikovsky. So? Snapped back Trump. Sir, you said Russian operas were okay. Hicks gently reminded him. And this one is a favorite of Mr. Putin's. Oh, yeah? Well, leave it on then, Trump mumbled. Hicks nodded compliantly, smiling straight on in a kind of frozen Stepford Wives daze. Suddenly, Trump took a sharp breath, huffing as his small eyes widened and his pupils dilated. Whoa, Trump's feeling dizzy, he said, grasping the armrests. As the rich, almost cloying sounds of Tchaikovsky swirled around him, louder and louder, Trump felt like he was on a speeding carousel, faster and faster until... Blackout. Then... A gavel hammered. Trump's eyes jolted open, and he found himself in a grand, stately courtroom. He looked up, and there was a diminutive, attractive young woman, barely visible behind the expansive podium, with four empty seats on either side of her. She wore oversized glasses and hoop earrings, a colorful silk scarf holding her modest chignon in place. Where am I? And who are you? Trump asked. Why, President Trump, the youngish woman chirped. We are in the main hearing chamber of the U.S. Supreme Court. You know me. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Trump stepped back, his mouth forming a perfect O. This sort of thing had happened to him before. Just a few months back, when he was visited one night by 18 of his predecessors, from George Washington to Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Yikes. Thinking back to that fateful night still gave him the heebie-jeebies. He had chalked it up to a dream. Now he wasn't so sure. But you're so young, Trump marveled. Yes, well, in this realm, we do tend to assume a different bodily form, Ginsburg replied. People are not going to believe this. The notorious RBG visiting me from the great beyond, Trump exclaimed. You know, a lot of people have taken to calling me the notorious D-O-N. Mr. Trump, you and I both know that no one has taken to calling you that. Ginsburg countered. Yeah, you're right, admitted Trump, but they should. Ginsburg continued. Now, although I crossed the Holy Veil only recently, I have come with a purpose. It is my final act in service to this wonderful nation. I implore you to honor my last and greatest wish, dictated to my granddaughter Clara in my final hours, that you refrain from naming my successor. The winner of the presidential election must make that selection. Sorry, Mrs. Ginsburg, Trump blurted, but as your boy Obama says, elections have consequences. Besides, I've already got my eye on who should replace you. That's justice, Ginsburg, Mr. Trump, said Ginsburg firmly. Be that as it may, I guess it's only right that you be the first to know the great RBG will be replaced by the great ACB, Trump said. That's right, Amy Coney. Barrett. I will not disqualify Judge Barrett, but allow me to provide an education of sorts as to my legacy, Ginsburg continued calmly. Perhaps if you were made aware of the paths I forged and the kinds of rights for which I fought, you may reconsider the choice you're now mulling. Not likely, replied Trump, but sure, Ruth, try me. 
Well, I co-founded the Women's Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union in 1972. In our first two years alone, we participated in over 300 cases, six of which I argued before the United States Supreme Court, all against discrimination on the basis of sex. Yeah, I tried to watch that movie about you on the basis of sex, but honestly, it was kind of boring. To tell you the truth, I wasn't paying much attention. All I could think about was the inevitable Trump movie. I have the perfect title for it, by the way. You're gonna love it. Trump. And there's only one actor who could possibly play me, and that is Brad Pitt. Throwing up her hands in dismay, Ginsburg explained as if to a teenager. Please, focus. I prefer to use the term gender discrimination because my secretary said the word sex would distract male judges. Huh. Sex, Trump sniggered. Yeah, your secretary was right. At times, continued Ginsburg, I made it a point to pick male plaintiffs to demonstrate that gender discrimination was harmful to both women and men. Yeah, I don't think so, huffed Trump. You don't see a lot of men trying to get the Supreme Court to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Surely you understand, Mr. Trump, that an amendment to the United States Constitution is different from a judicial decision. Of course I do, but that's the problem. The courts aren't supposed to legislate, exclaimed Trump, missing Ginsburg's point entirely. It's up to me, the president, and I suppose Congress too, to make big, beautiful, sweeping decisions for the American people. It's a lot harder than, you know, showing up in court and batting your eyelashes at the judges. Somehow, maintaining her composure, RBG declared, I will have you know that my cases were fought and won by putting forth strategic arguments in carefully selected cases, each building on the last, until gender was adjudicated to be a protected class. Yeah, well, at least you won. I'll give you that, Trump muttered. I can't stand losers. Ginsburg pleaded. Mr. President, I implore you, for the sake of the American people, let the winner of this election, which is to be imminently decided, fill this vacancy. Please honor the mandate of the people. I am, blared the president. They wanted Trump, and they got Trump. The Republicans won the Senate in 2016 and again in 2018, so now me and Mitch McConnell get to fill your seat. In fact, it's my constitutional duty. And I know just how much your constitutional duties mean to you, replied RBG. Ginsburg was suddenly bathed in a white spotlight. She opened her mouth and emitted the voice of an angel singing a famous aria from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. As dozens of red roses were flung at her from an unseen, adoring audience, Ruth Bader Ginsburg faded from view. Trump then startled himself awake, and he was back on Air Force One. What the hell was that, he wondered. While he could not get the aria out of his head, RBG's operatic message was lost on him. In Mozart's masterpiece, the character of Don Giovanni, a cunning Lothario who takes pleasure in women's distress as he seduces them, ultimately has hell to pay. As he nibbled on a flaccid fry from the bottom of a McDonald's container, Trump suddenly and inexplicably shuddered. I'm not quite sure how time and again George S. Corey manages to thread the needle, marrying such biting political satire with a heartfelt homage to RBG. My guess is there will be many a listener with tears of both laughter and sadness. Now, as I do every episode, I'd like to conclude with a quote 
This one from who else? The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her hopeful reflection on the court remains chillingly on point and can be equally applied to our society and culture. My hope is that we will get back to the way it once was, that kind of collegiality, good relations, people who liked and respected each other, even though they disagreed on some important questions. Thank you, Justice Ginsburg, for this reminder and for a lifetime of service. We remember and honor you. I cannot wait for next month's episode, the second in our election series. It's called Waiting for Our Vote. George and Cleo tackle voting rights just in time for the midterm elections. I promise you won't want to miss it when it drops on Monday, October 31st. Yes, Halloween. Remember, new episodes always premiere on the last Monday of the month. I want to thank Robin Miles and Stephen DeRosa, and an extra special thank you to George S. Corey and Cleo. Most of all, I want to thank you, our loyal listeners. As always, we are thrilled to have you with us. We welcome you to follow the Social Contract Podcast, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, and we'd love it if you rate and review us. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at MyTSCPodcast. You can visit George S. Corey at georgescorey.com and Cleo at theartistcleo.com. This has been the Social Contract Podcast, created by George S. Corey and Cleo, produced and hosted by Tavia Gilbert, associate producer Katie Flood, music courtesy of Listen Audio, mix and master by Kayla Elrod. This has been a podcast from Listen Audio in association with TalkBox Productions.